Uh, okay, Gareth, uh, uh, please go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Renzo. So it's a real pleasure to have the opportunity to talk with everyone about uh, our work on the topology of soft materials. And I'd like to try today to give you a flavor of some of the things that we've been thinking about recently on a more geometric aspect of topology in liquid crystals. So let me start by showing you um, some kind of small sample of the sorts of things that have been going on over the past 10, 15 years or so, and have been motivating uh, my work in materials topology. So this is a collection of um, experimental images <clears throat> of uh, different types of topology in liquid crystal textures. So there are, for instance, the defect proliferated phases. This is um, called the twist screen boundary phase, and it's an analog of the famous Abrikosov phase in type two superconductors, but in a liquid crystal environment. And then there are examples that come from um, uh, either droplets or shells, where you have some pneumatic material that's confined to a spherical surface, and um, the properties that it exhibits reflects that. So for instance, here's a, a movie showing a topic of considerable current interest in active materials, where you see some kind of active liquid crystalline uh, texture covering the surface of a sphere, and the little points that you see moving around are defects in it. And those defects um, reflect the topology of the sphere in that uh, you have this poincare hopf index theorem that relates the total charge of the defects to the Euler characteristic of the surface. And there are a collection of other results. This is a, a reconstruction of an experiment that I was involved in about uh, six years ago now, maybe a little longer, where uh, we realized the celebrated Hopf map in a liquid crystal environment and were able to reconstruct the image directly or reconstruct a, a representation of the Hopf texture directly from the experimental data. And, and lastly, I have a couple of examples of things that you can do by putting colloidal particles into a liquid crystal host. And there's really tremendous variety in the things that you can do here. Um, so I gave only two flavors. One, with modern fabrication techniques, you can create uh, colloidal particles on the micron scale with more or less arbitrary uh, structure, topology, and surface anchoring conditions. This is a, a, an influential paper from Ivan Shmaluk's group where they made colloidal handle bodies of different genus, genus one, so a torus, genus two, genus three, up to genus five. And you ask how does the topology of the colloid uh, interact with the topology that is induced around it in the liquid crystal material. And uh, lastly, something that inspired a uh, considerable focus of my research over the past um, six or seven years is this beautiful experiment that came out of the Ljubljana group where they put arrays of spherical colloidal particles into a liquid crystal host that nucleates defect lines in the uh, liquid crystal that surrounds it. So there are somehow some line-like defect in the liquid crystal material and by controlling the colloids with laser tweezers, you could tie those lines into different knots. So here they have an example of a trefoil knot, a Solomon link, pentafoil, star of David, and they discovered that um, if they tried hard enough, they could generate any knot that you wanted. So um, I'm not trying to explain too much about all of the details that are going on in uh, each of these examples. I just want to give you a very brief flavor, an impression of the sorts of things that can be done and uh, the things that uh, motivate and inspire me. And, and in particular, 
to emphasize that there are a great number of current experiments in this particular area with lots and lots and lots of different topological features going on. So there are plenty of things for theorists like myself to try to contribute. Okay, well, um, first of all, I should say a few words about what liquid crystals are, um, just to make sure that um, anybody that's not perhaps as familiar as I am at least has some, some idea of, of what the material is and um, uh, some of the terminology that goes alongside it. So, for instance, if you look in a standard textbook on um, soft matter physics or on liquid crystals, this is the sort of description that you might find, that the idea in these materials is that they are made of long rod-like molecules. So you can think of a, a rod or a cylinder Frequently, I like to think in terms of a piece of chalk, and it's important that it should be a chalk for writing on a blackboard rather than a, a marker pen for writing on a whiteboard, because the, the phase has the property that you can write with either end. The two ends are completely indistinguishable from each other, so that the um, alignment or the orientation of each of the molecules or the rods in the system is that of a line-like object rather than a bona fide vector field. That symmetry property is behind a lot of the topological features that enter into the material properties. Okay, so these molecules can uh, do a number of things. At high temperatures, they can point in uncorrelated directions, and you have effectively an isotropic fluid. If you cool it down, then you can start to induce alignment between the molecules, and the different types of alignment that can arise correspond to the different types of liquid crystal phases that exist. The simplest one is simply that they all point in the same direction. So in this little cartoon, all the molecules have spontaneously decided that they should point in the vertical direction. So there is long range correlation in the direction of the molecules. And that direction is typically noted, denoted by a uh, unit vector that we give the symbol N to and call the director field. So that's a little jargon that I would use to write, and, and I hope mentioning it here, you'll be able to keep that in mind. But in this simplest phase, in the, in the pneumatic phase, um, although there's alignment of the molecules, there's no positional ordering. They remain a full three-dimensional fluid. And if you uh, cool the material down further, then you can start to establish, in addition to the alignment, also some uh, positional ordering. In the first instance, this positional ordering is only along one direction. So again, in, in this image, it's in the vertical direction where the molecules are regularly spaced. There's some regular repeat length between them along the vertical direction, but horizontally they remain fluid-like. So this is somehow a one-dimensional crystal and a two-dimensional fluid. We refer to that as a smectic liquid crystal. In particular, this one is a smectic A material. And if there is a, an angle, so a tilt, between the alignment of the molecules and the alignment of the layers in the smectic, then that's referred to as a smectic C. And there's a whole bunch of other uh, types of, of uh, combinations of orientational and positional ordering that you can have. But somehow the important ones for what I'm going to talk about are the pneumatic phase and uh, to a lesser extent the smectic one. And also, um, as we'll see on the next slide, something called a cholesteric. So here's a, um, a second view uh, or a, a second summary of the same material that there are the same. Um, yeah, the same, let me say the same material exposition of what liquid crystals are. There are different types, pneumatics, cholesterics, and smectics. They're all 
characterized by some kind of orientational order or alignment of the molecules, which we describe by this unit vector called the director, that really is a line-like object. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't have any um, n and minus n are physically indistinguishable from each other. And uh, typical materials are not uniformly aligned absolutely everywhere, but show some slow spatial variation in the local alignment of the molecules. And that leads to a macroscopic description in terms of an elasticity theory, where you look at the way in which the director varies with position, so its gradients, and you construct an energy that's built out of the different scalar invariants that you can write, on, write down, built out of the derivatives of the director field. And I'll say a little bit more about um, how you come up with the, the different invariants later on in the talk. Uh, but this is somehow a classic idea of uh, developing an elasticity theory for non-uniformities in the director field. Um, cholesterics differ from pneumatics in, in some respects only in the fact that you have gone to a chemist friend and um, asked for a molecule that has a well-defined handedness, that has a preference, say for instance, to be right-handed, and then you add a small percentage weight, one or two percent weight of this right-handed molecule to a pneumatic liquid crystal, and the preferred handedness of the dopant uh, translates itself into a preferred handedness of the material on the macroscopic scale, and we refer to that state as a cholesteric phase. And in terms of the energy, it corresponds to adding a coupling with a strength that is proportional to the amount of, of chiral dopant that you've added, and which favors a non-zero value for this twist distortion, which I will have more to say about uh, throughout the rest of my seminar. And finally, here's a, an example of what a smectic looks like. It's described in terms of some uh, mass density variation because there is, uh, trend, there's correlations in the positions or in the mass density of the material. I'll say slightly less about them. Okay, well, one of the things that you might have already uh, noticed from the previous slide, and which is somehow uh, fundamental to the description of liquid crystal textures and their behavior, is that in addition to this local alignment of the molecules, there are also defects in that orientational order. So places where the order is ill-defined or discontinuous or breaks down in some fundamental fashion. And often these uh, defects in the material dominate its properties, the way that it looks, the way that it responds, the way that you describe it. Um, and, and so it can be of tremendous benefit to really understand in some detail the different defects that can arise, how you describe them, and how you can control them in order to design particular material properties. And this is a, a, an old subject. It is one of the original applications of the methods of topology in the physical sciences, developed in the mid-1970s under uh, what has become known as the homotopy theory of topological defects in materials, for which the standard reference is this wonderful review article that David Merman wrote in 1979. And um, so what it does, loosely speaking, is it brings in the methods of homotopy theory to tell you what are the different possible defects that you can have in any sort of ordered media, whether it be a liquid crystal mm -hmm. or a superfluid or um, uh, uh, or any other type of orientationally ordered uh, medium, something in which there is um, a broken, that is characterized by a broken symmetry, then you can classify the defects by the general methods of um, homotopy theory. And for instance, just as a very brief summary of what this tells you, 
for pictures, classic pictures of mimetics that look like this one at the top. This is called a Schlieren texture. The defects are these little points where the dark black so-called brushes come together. They meet either in twos or in fours, in this picture at least. And uh, the idea is that you should characterize them by looking at the behavior of the director, so the behavior of the local orientation of the molecules on some circle that goes around the defect point itself. That corresponds to an orientation, so an element of um, RP1, a line element in the plane, at every point on some circle that goes around the defect. And up to homotopy, that's classified by an element of the fundamental group of RP1, which is the half integers. So somehow there are an infinite number of different point defects that you can have that are characterized by a winding number, which is any half integer multiple of 2 pi. This extends to many other situations, for instance, telling you about the defects also in properly three-dimensional materials. If you had a, a line singularity, so a defect along an entire one-dimensional line, then again, you uh, characterize its local properties by looking at how the orientation varies around some circle that goes around that line. And uh, that corresponds to an element of the fundamental group of RP2, which is Z mod 2. So essentially, either the director field is orientable around this uh, circuit, or it's non-orientable. And when it's non-orientable, there's a, a topologically protected singular line um, that we call disclinations, that are, are, are some of the um, uh, central features in um, topology of liquid crystal fuses. Much of what I'll talk about and focus on uh, in my seminar today, uh, focuses on point defects in three dimensions. So those are isolated points where the orientation is ill-defined, or singular. And those are classified by the behavior on a spherical surface that encloses the points. So by uh, an element of the second homotopy group, of RP2, which corresponds to the integers. So those are some of the classical results of classifying uh, defects in ordered media, give you some flavor of the, the sort of simple ideas or applications of algebraic topology to understanding properties and materials. Let me uh, say a little more about it. So for instance, very briefly, here are some examples of the creation of point defects in liquid crystals, either in a spherical droplet, so you should imagine what's, what, what's being shown in this image is a spherical droplet where the alignment is perpendicular to the boundary. So think of a purely radial field that is singular at the center of the droplet, which is what you're looking at here. So the orientation is described by this purely radial unit vector field, singular at the center, and has uh, satisfies normal anchoring boundary conditions on the surface. So that's one setting in which you can experimentally realize this. And the, a complementary setting is that instead of having the liquid crystal interior of a spherical uh, droplet, you can have it sit outside a solid spherical inclusion, but with the same radial boundary conditions. And then what you find is that there is an accompanying point defect in the ordering of the liquid crystal and the local structure around it is given by uh, this little unit vector field, which we refer to as a hyperbolic hedgehog. Um, okay. To say maybe slightly more about that, those are really different things, different types of point defects. The point defects can be classified by a topological charge or degree that comes by looking at the winding number or the the degree on a spherical surface that encloses the point defect. You can calculate it in a number of ways. There's some integral formula. There are some more um, homology-based uh, definitions of it that um, um, 
identify the homotopy class of the point defect in the material. And the ones that I showed you on the previous page correspond. The radial one here corresponds to degree plus one, and the hyperbolic one to degree minus one, as examples. But in principle, you can realize, or at least there is a, um, according to the homotopy theory, you can realize any integer, positive or negative. Um, for the purposes of uh, visualization of things that you see in experiment or that you generate uh, numerically in numerical simulations, the purpose of trying to, to calculate what this topological invariant is, whether it's plus one or minus one, say, it's difficult to do this integral explicitly in many cases. And there are, so it, it's nice to have more convenient ways of representing the texture and identifying the topology. And one that we developed was an application of this Pontryag and Tom construction that, um, well, in, in simple and direct terms, is the representation of the texture by some surface in the material. It is a surface where the orientation is horizontal. So if I take as an example this radial vector field, it is horizontal in the xy plane, and the surface corresponds exactly to that xy plane. And then you can color the surface according to whatever the horizontal orientation is. So these colored surfaces give you very directly a visual representation of what the ordering or what the local orientation of the molecules in the material happens to be. Um, and by counting the winding of the color around any singular points, you can determine what the degree, what the type of that point defect happens to be. So this is a, a convenient visualization technique that uh, faithfully captures the topological information in the texture. As a very brief example of it, let me show this reconstruction that we developed a number of years back for the hop texture, where the surface, remember this is a surface where the director is horizontal, it now is a, a torus, and the coloring on it is telling you what the horizontal orientation is. If you stare at it long enough, you will see that the different horizontal orientations all correspond to circles on this torus that link with each other and that link with each other precisely once. So that's the basic characterization of the property of the famous Hopf map. And uh, this indeed is an experimental realization of that, uh, a representation of it that really faithfully captures all the topology. As a final thing to say about um, uh, the use of uh, algebra methods of uh, homotopy theory in understanding the properties of materials. Let me mention briefly a uh, result of our own from a few years back that was inspired by this beautiful work of the Ljubljana group on creating uh, knotted defect lines in liquid crystals. You can ask yourself the following question about this. If you choose a particular knot, like for instance, the figure eight knot, you can ask if you were to realize this in a liquid crystal, how many distinct homotopy classes of liquid crystal textures could you create with that fixed figure eight knot as a defect set? Or um, rather more suggestively, I might say, what is the knot table for pneumatic knots. And we were able to answer that question using the methods of homotopy theory. The simplest way of saying it is that it turns out the number is equal to the knot determinant. That's the value of the Alexander polynomial evaluated at minus one. And a slightly more precise statement of it is given in terms of this correspondence between the homotopy classes and the homology of the double branched cover of the knot column. Okay, so I maybe not explain too much about this result. I just want to give a small flavor of the sorts of things 
that the methods of um, homotopy theory have been able to provide in understanding textures in liquid crystal phases and the richness that is out there um, and is uh, experimentally accessible in, over the past uh, 10 years or so. Okay, well, what I really want to talk about today, the real focus that I have been shifting towards in the past few years in my research, is that um, the methods of homotopy theory tell you a lot about the properties of the material, but they certainly don't tell you everything. And I think this is a, a nice example of the sort of tension that there is in understanding the properties of, of materials, the topological properties of materials. This is a collection of images showing what are called focal conics in smectic materials. And I don't want to say too much about it. I just want to show the image for long enough to give you the clear and distinct impression that whatever you're looking at here, and however you're going to understand it, it's definitely a very strongly geometric thing. In addition to any topology that it might have, it's definitely a geometric phenomenon or a geometric uh, behavior that you're looking at in this image. And so one of the things that I've become increasingly interested in is in trying to capture the results that were obtained previously using um, directly the tools of homotopy theory, trying to recover those instead in more geometric uh, fashion. So let me say a, a few words about these focal conics and where the geometry comes in. One of my favorite stories in understanding the properties of materials of how it is that we came to know what smectics are. Um, it was uh, first understood in this paper by Georges Friedel and Francois Grandjean from 1910. And purely from looking at images of this type in light optical microscopy, they saw these uh, geometrically precise ellipses. And associated to them, there are uh, features at the focus of the ellipse that also turn out to be um, associated with, with lines in the material, the lines in this sketch from their paper, which are hyperbole that pass through the focus of the ellipse and the ellipse passes through the focus of the hyperbola. So they're so-called confocal conics. And uh, they realized just from that geometric arrangement that the material must be made of two-dimensional fluid layers with a rigorously equal spacing between them. And more than that, that the layers must correspond to a family of the cyclides of Dupin. Somehow that's a result in classical differential geometry, and it's a, a, a powerful insight into the character of this material. It's the, the uh, giveaway uh, texture that you're looking at a smectic, that it contains these focal conics, and it's a, a, an insight into the material which is very solidly of geometric character. So maybe I will um, show only very briefly this um, image of what the actual surfaces look like that uh, comes from this old paper of uh, Maxwell's just to give you some insight of, or some, some flavor of what the cycloids look like. Okay, so uh, what I would like to really try to focus on and give you a flavor about uh, for the rest of the talk is um, an attempt to uh, capture the topological features in liquid crystal textures in geometric, natural geometric terms. And the basic idea for this goes back to the elasticity theory of liquid crystals that was developed by Frank in the late 1950s. Uh, the elasticity theory, as he presented it, has resulted in the, the naming of the fundamental distortions that exist in liquid crystals, display, twist, bend, and what's called saddle splay. And the names 
are really deliberately correspond to the geometric character of the variation in the director field or the variation in the orientation that each corresponds to. And um, one of the ways of, of thinking about this is that it's a, an analysis of the uh, gradients in the director field, so the non-uniformity in the director field, that is broken apart into natural independent pieces according to whether the derivatives are in directions that are parallel to the local orientation or in directions that are perpendicular. One of the ways of thinking about this is that at each point in the material you have a local orientation and you also have um, symmetries that preserve that local orientation. So any rotations about this local direction will preserve the director field and you can decompose the gradients of the director with respect to the action of that local symmetry group and when you do so you pick up exactly these four terms. One of the ways that you should think about it is there are the parallel derivatives and then there are the derivatives along perpendicular directions you can think of those as being directly analogous to the ship operator in classical differential geometry, which has a, splits itself into three components, one of which tells you about the mean curvature of the director field, one of which tells you about the twisting or the sense in which the director is not, does not coincide with the normal to some family of surfaces, and a final piece, which is a is deviatoric or traceless symmetric, and so has eigenvectors, and those eigenvectors correspond to the directions of principal curvature in the material. This last part, I will say uh, briefly, being a um, uh, a little geometric matrix, two by two matrix, it has geometric degeneracies that are associated with the standard sort of geometric phases and those degeneracies or zeros um, encode uh, topological information about the material in an exact analog of the uh, Hopf index theorem. So for instance, in the, to, to make further connection with the ge differential geometry of surfaces where I said this decomposition is, or this, these orthogonal gradients or are analogous to the shape operator in differential geometry. And these principal directions are the principal directions of curvature, and their zeros or degeneracies are the umbilic points of any surface whose number will tell you what the Euler characteristic of the surface happens to be. Okay. So uh, the first problem that I want to tell you about focuses on the geometric topology that is contained in twist deformations in the director field and is inspired by this collection of images from Gregor Posniak's experiments at University of Ljubljana. The experiment is to take a spherical droplet fill it with a chiral liquid crystal material, so a liquid crystal that likes to have a right-handed character, so it wants to be right-handed, and is, uh, satisfies normal anchoring boundary conditions on the surface. And he sees in these experiments a tremendous variety of different things. Um, and I, I want to draw your attention to the fact that uh, they have some strong geometric character to them. For instance, here we see a nice equilateral triangle. Here we see a regular tetrahedral configuration or geometry coming up. And in these more sophisticated things, again, you see regular tetrahedra or regular diprisms. So there are many uh, questions or, or aspects of the geometric topological flavor to try to address in thinking about these experiments. 
And I have a set of uh, sort of basic questions that I um, extracted from the, this experimental work or that, that I tried to, to uh, address or was inspired by, by, by these experiments. And the main one for me will be to try to explain to you what it means to say that these particular experiments, more than that, the defects in these particular systems, what does it mean to say that they are chiral, that they have some well-defined handedness associated to them? Okay, well, I, I've been talking for longer than I had planned to at this stage, uh, but Renzo did suggest that I should pause and ask if there are any questions that anybody has. And uh, yeah, this Garrett, is an excellent I'm... place to do so. Garrett, I've got a so question. Have... Those point defects that you see, these are on the surface of a two-sphere that, that's full of these chiral molecules. So are that's the endpoints an... the end or an... lines of defect? That's an excellent question. And it is one of the things that we want to try to understand. So the, what happens is that uh, the, the Defects that look yellow, so like the one I'm pointing at here, sit close to the surface. The other ones, for instance, this one, this uh, purple one, or the one that is cyan here, those really sit right at the center, of well in the interior of the droplet and away from the surface. And as far as the things that I'm showing and focusing on here, these are really isolated point defects. They're not the termination of a line, if that clarifies the question that you asked. Yeah. Were there any other well, I, questions? Uh, yes, I have uh, two, two curiosities. Is one, one is about when you mentioned the winding numbers or high, high winding numbers. How are, High winding numbers uh, uh, detecting kind of stability. What's the relationship between stability of these objects and their winding number? I understand that there are many systems with winding number one defects. Uh, winding number one are stable, whereas uh, like in GPE, you certainly know that uh, higher order uh, winding numbers uh, uh, mean uh, uh, certain instability so that the effect of n winding number or n charge goes down to n defects of one charge. Right. That's another excellent question. Um, so let me hide this for a second. Uh, I think uh, the honest answer to your question is that, that we don't know very much about this at the present moment in time. So let me comment on that with regard to these experiments. Um, it is indeed the case that you expect the defects of the lowest charge to have the lowest energy. And so the minimum energy configuration should have defects with charge plus and minus one. And more than that, it should have the minimal number of those defects. That corresponds to this image in the upper left, where there is a single defect and its charge is plus one. Somehow, all of the other images that I'm showing you are excitations above that state, at least in a naive sense. And in particular, the uh, experiments where you see defects whose charge is not plus or minus one. So for instance, this is an example where the charge is minus two. This is an example where the charge is minus three. Naively, you would expect those defects to break apart. For instance, this one, whose charge is minus three, to break apart into three with strength minus one. And um, in pneumatic materials, you only ever see defects with degree plus and minus one. These higher charge ones have not been seen in pneumatic materials. But in these chiral materials, you do see them, and they appear to be at least metastable. Uh, that's both in experiments and also in uh, the simulations that I'll show in the upcoming slides. 
but I think it's fair to say at the present moment in time, in time there's not and there's not detailed understanding of why they should be stable against the sort of naive arguments that everybody has been making for some period of time, if that makes sense. All right, thank you. Did we have if any I other may, questions? Or? If I may, I Please have actually ahead. another curiosity. <laughs> Is is any relationship between the Euler characteristic and the number of anchoring points of uh, of these defects in the surface on the boundary surface? So the number of defects on the surface. Oh, well, you mentioned the Euler characteristic that is clearly um, somewhere um, not even hidden, but is present in uh, when you talk about uh, uh, your degrees and. Uh, um, the indices associated with the degrees. I wonder if that the Euler characteristic is any relationship between the Euler characteristic of the system and the anchoring points. Yeah. So in in this particular system, the the Demian is a spherical droplet, if you like, a ball, and the boundary yes. conditions are that the orientation is normal at the surface of the ball, and then um, the, the result, the, the Hopf index theorem will tell you that the number of zeros in the interior has to add up to the Euler characteristic of the ball, which is plus one. Right. So the way that that works okay. here is that you have a single defect at the center of the droplet with degree minus two, and then it's accompanied by three, each with degree plus one that sit closer to the surface. So plus three minus two gives you the total count of plus one. And that, uh, <laughs> that counting follows through in, in all of the examples. Thank you. Okay, well maybe I will continue, um, but I do encourage you to, uh, if you have questions from this point on, to please stop me and ask them. Uh, um, and I will, um, We'll see Sorry, how far we get. One question before we go on. Are there yes. extra symmetries in these in these chiral uh, materials that you don't see? Are there extra? Symmetries? I didn't quite catch the question. Are, are there additional symmetries in these in these materials that are not in the the ones where the defects uh, where a higher degree defects don't appear? I, um, I, so what should I say? Um, the, on the one hand, the only difference is that there is an energetic preference for a non-zero twist in these materials. The, the uh, fundamental symmetry of them has not changed. That being said, uh, what I will explain next is that the, in order to have a well-defined handedness, the structure in the vicinity of these points has to be quite special. So maybe when I explain that, it will clarify uh, the sense in which the answer to your question could be interpreted as yes, they're quite, they have a, some additional symmetry, um, while at the same time the sort of um, Direct upfront response to it is that the symmetry is the same. Okay, thanks. Okay, so what I want to focus on is this last question um, How do these materials happen to be chiral? And there's a couple of ways of getting at it. Perhaps um, for my purposes, the most, uh, the fastest is um, to look at the energy of them. So I had this in one of my introductory slides, put it up again, you build an energy out of the gradients of the director field, you think of the different uh, scalar quantities that you can make out of the gradients of the director field and you write down some free energy, some elasticity. Are the keys depending on temperature? Uh, the Ks depend on temperature. Yes. yes, they do depend on temperature. But that's not going to be, for, for our theoretical purposes, we will imagine that they're just constants. 
Okay. And the game that we're going to play, the theoretical game that we play with this, is to imagine that uh, the second constant is enormous compared to the other two. So we get to simplify our energy by forgetting the first term and the third term, focusing only on the second one. And then we will obtain minimal energy configurations if we can choose this object, the twist n dot curl n, to be equal to minus this parameter, which is loosely speaking the amount of chiral dopant that you've added to your material. Now it turns out there's a convenient way of solving this equation, which is instead of working with a unit vector field, you introduce a vector field whose magnitude is free and which satisfies this curl eigenfield equation. So it's a so-called curl eigenfield or a Beltrami field. And then you take the director to be the normalization of this curl eigenfield. Turns out if you do that, then anywhere where the director is defined, n dot curl n is exactly minus q naught. And the defects in the director field are going to correspond exactly to the zeros of this curl eigenfield. So we can get insight into the structure of these chiral point defects and the properties that they have by looking at the structure of zeros of curl eigenfields. And um, in typical phys physicist style, we're going to do that by a little Taylor series expansion. So that has the following structure. You write down a little Taylor series for what this vector, this uh, curl eigenfield should look like around a place where it is zero, then it has linear and quadratic terms, and it satisfies this eigenfunction equation. So we should compute its curl and set it equal to itself. And in calculating the curl, you reduce the degree by one. So the linear terms go to the constant ones, the quadratic terms go to the linear ones, so forth. And the part that is somehow crucial in appreciating the structure of these chiral materials is that the linear terms go to the constant part and the constant part is zero. In other words, whatever the linear part of the, this curl eigenfield is, it has to be curl free. And that means that it is the gradient of a function. So the local structure is very special. It's not a generic vector field, it's a gradient vector field plus higher order terms. And that turns out to have a number of consequences of which I list three. The first is that these generic defects are not, that, that generic point defects, the so generic zeros in a vector field are not chiral. The chiral ones have a linear term that is curl free. Curl of a vector, of course, is another vector. So if you want to make it vanish, you have to set all three components of it to zero. That's telling you that these, the ones that are chiral, the ones that are of this form, have codimension three within the space of generic zeros in a vector field. Um, it's this structural part that is the somehow the extra symmetry that is possessed by chiral point defects over generic ones that I alluded to on the previous slide. The second thing is that because the structure is the gradient of some function, more than that, a function that, uh, because you're expanding about a place where the uh, vector, where, where there is a zero in the vector field, this is the gradient of a function that has an isolated critical point at the origin. And so the classification is given by the classification of isolated critical points of a function or by singularity theory. And that gives a finer classification of the defects than you would get just using the topological degree. And the last thing is that actually it turns out that the function is not arbitrary. It has to be a harmonic function. And the reason for that is because the defining equation, this curl eigenfield equation, if you take its divergence, the left-hand side is identically zero, 
So the divergence of the vector field has to vanish. And if the vector field is locally a gradient of a function, that tells you the function is harmonic. And that immediately tells you that any of the chiral point defects have to be have to come from a critical point that is a saddle. Maxima and minima are excluded by the maximum principle in, in analysis. Okay, so these chiral defects have a number of very special properties. Let me um, show you how these properties correlate with things that you see in the experiments. So first of all, there is a distinction between generic defects and ones that are genuinely chiral. The chiral ones are, are not the generic type. They have a special structural property. And so you expect to see two different types of defects. You expect to see ones that are really generic and are not chiral, and then ones that are special and are. And what I'm, I'm showing you here in this image by color, I'm showing you the handedness of the material. If you see blue, it is right-handed, and if you see red, it is left-handed. And indeed, the things that sit in the interior that are supposed to have a well-defined handedness are surrounded by a single handedness, they're all blue, and the ones that are more generic that sit at the surface of the droplet um, sit at the interface between right and left-handed regions. That's um, ultimately the reason why they are pushed to the surface. They have to be excluded from the region that has a well-defined handedness. So they go and sit near the surface. For the second point about classification with singularity theory, the so singularity theory gives you a systematic way of enumerating the different uh, critical points, isolated critical points of a function that you can have. This is the celebrated ADE classification of Arnold, giving the simple singularities. And at the bottom, I show uh, realizations of them in the order in which they are appear in this classification that were provided by, um, so the optics realizations were provided by John Nye and Michael Berry in their work on caustics in the 1970s. And um, above, I show um, the listing that you get for the defects, for the point defects in cholesterics. So again, if you go through the table, you get to produce by little Taylor series expansions, local structures that correspond very nicely, very precisely with the things that are seen in experiments. So it has much the same flavor but with a small difference that uh, you don't quite see things in exactly the order that's in this table, largely speaking because um, the, the things that appear that are simple singularities don't have the higher degrees that are seen in some of the experimental defects. So the higher degree objects correspond to much more uh, sophisticated singularities. This one with degree minus three corresponds to the unimodal singularity T444. But otherwise, the, the ideas and classification of singularity theory provide you with a ready-made framework for identifying and classifying these chiral point defects and with excellent agreement against the experiment. It does a little more than this because Coming back to the question that Renzo asked about the defects breaking apart into simpler pieces, there is a ready-made framework within singularity theory for describing how degenerate critical points break apart into simpler ones. It's the theory of the unfoldings of isolated singularities. And you can uh, apply that framework and machinery to study the way in which the a higher degree chiral point defects be split into simpler pieces. And again, there's really very nice agreement between the sorts of things that you can see from applying this, these little 
local Taylor series and what has been observed in experiments, both for the splittings of the degree minus two defects and the splittings of uh, degree minus three ones as well. And uh, finally, I said that uh, the function is harmonic and that excludes certain behavior. So in particular, it means that the critical point must have the structure of a saddle. So it should not be radial, maxima and minima are excluded. And uh, this was a somewhat of a surprise to me, and I think when I, when I came across it, and I think it's an, an interesting aspect of uh, chiral materials that radial structures or radial fields are uh, incompatible with chirality, so with being right-handed, in a fundamental and in fact topological fashion. So any time that you try to force the orientation to have this radial character to look like a maximum or a minimum, or simply to be radial, that cause, uh, causes a fundamental frustration in the handedness of the material that I've been referring to as topological chirality. So as an example of that, these experiments are all done in spherical droplets with radial boundary conditions. So at the surface of the defect, we have this fundamental frustration and there must necessarily be regions of both right and left-handed material, at least in some boundary layer close to the surface. So I show you an um, example of that from a numerical simulation where again it's color coded such that if it's blue it's right handed and if it's red it's left handed and although there's nothing singular there are no defects close to the surface there still is this topologically required region that has the wrong handedness close to the surface of the droplet so this uh, for me was a slightly surprising aspect of, of chiral materials, that they have this topological feature, they have this topological requirement for reversals of handedness under certain circumstances. The result, um, in fact, is not just a sort of heuristic one, it's a, an interesting um, theorem, relatively recent one, um, from about 20 years ago that was established by Eli Ashberg and Thurston in their work on what they call confoliations. So that's somehow a uh, portmanteau of uh, contact structures and, and uh, foliations for uh, what, naive, what traditionally we would have thought of in the liquid crystal community as an interface between smectic materials and cholesteric ones. Okay. Um, so maybe to finish in the, in the last minute or so, I will um, not go through this more technical uh, slides uh, giving an exposition of how they established this result in general, and instead show you um, a, a second realization of this topological chirality that we constructed in a different geometry. So this is a geometry of uh, cylindrical capillaries where for simplicity I'm adopting periodic boundary conditions top and bottom, but it's fixed on the surface of something you should imagine as a cross section through a cylinder with normal anchoring boundary conditions. And then the orientation um, rotates to align along the axis of the capillary at the center. It's referred to as escape in the third dimension in the liquid crystal community. And again, I have this coloring that everything is blue to indicate that it's uniformly right-handed. And what we're looking for is a way to frustrate that in a topological fashion. The way that that works is that there are two types of this escape along the axis of the cylinder, you can either escape up as currently, or if you turn it the other way around, you can escape down. And the interface between the two of them is marked by the presence of some uh, point defect 
It reflects the fact that there's no continuous transformation between the skip up and the skip down. So if I realize that situation with um, uh, transitions between the skip down, the skip up, and the skip down again, then at each of the interfaces, I have these point defects. And the important feature uh, uh, of the, um, this particular arrangement is that the uh, defect that interpolates between uh, escape up and escape down, this defect, is locally associated with a radial configuration or radial uh, alignment of the director field. And so this result of Eli Ashberg and Thurston applies, which tells you that in the vicinity of this defect, there must necessarily be a region with the reversed handedness. And indeed, if you um, simulate it, that's exactly what you see, both immediately around the point defect and also uh, close to the surface of the cylinder. And if you increase the strength of the chirality, so the amount that it wants to be right-handed everywhere, you can make the defects themselves uniformly chiral but this ring of reverse handedness that has a topological character to it, of course, persists. I think uh, with that, I will stop. And uh, thank you all for listening and take any remaining questions that you might have. Thank you, Gareth. A wonderful Gareth. talk. Thank you very much. Do we have questions? And um, so somehow the, the ones that are um, most directly relevant to the experimental setup are in these chiral materials because it turns out that they're slightly more stable. You can do more things with them. Um, they have better sort of metastability properties. But uh, at the present moment in time, we have a good handle on how to explicitly construct knots in pneumatic materials, but not so good at how to explicitly construct them, and in particular, control their chiral properties in a chiral material. Um, and so the things that I told you about today was um, how to understand what it means for point defects to be chiral, and the continuation of that to understand properly what it means for a line defect to be chiral, and then subsequently a knotted line defect to be chiral. Those things uh, we're working on but have not been completed yet. Thank you. What, 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 sorts, of, what sorts of physical properties are reflected by these different defects in chiral materials? It's a, an excellent question. So um, the, the main thing, uh, most of it is not known, but the, the main thing that is uh, known at present, or the main thing that, that you can see from these experiments are two things. You get a much richer variety of things that are at least metastable as compared to pneumatics. In pneumatics, you effectively only see droplets of this type without modifying the anchoring conditions on the surface. And the second thing is that many of the arrangements that come up here have a very striking of, uh, geometric character to them. There's, there are very uh, nice and precise geometric arrangements of multiple defects up to uh, there are six here. I think there are nine in this image at the lower right. And um, you can imagine trying to control specifically the arrangement of the, the individual defects, the number of them that you have and the arrangement that they are, by having some understanding of um, what it is that determines that geometric structure. So for instance, coming from the little local models that I tried to describe, and then um, 
knowing that you can generate droplets with a large number of defects in some controlled positions, you could try to functionalize them in some form. Um, but a lot of this is still at, a, at an early and speculative stage. So that gives a maybe a partial answer to your question, although at this stage not a very good one. Thanks. Well, if there are no further questions, I think I think we should uh, thank Gareth very much for this beautiful talk. Very inspiring. Lots lots of uh, questions that come from geometry and topology that intersect with the physical problems. Oh, thank you very much, Gareth. Thank you. Well done. Thank you.